Welcome back to The Code Wolf, and in today's video, we're going to explore how to use a SQL Server database when developing apps locally. We'll see how to get the container up and running and connect to it, how to create and seed data in that database, how to persist data across container life cycles, and even how to run database commands directly inside the container itself. We'll also explore why and when you might want to use this workflow in the first place. There's a lot to cover here, so let's just jump right in. As a quick side note, the Code Wolf channel is approaching 2,000 subscribers, which is super exciting. Thanks for all the support. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing. There is plenty more content on the way. The prerequisites for this video are pretty simple. You will need Docker Desktop installed to follow along, and you can download that for your platform on their homepage. And you will need .NET installed if you want to follow along with the sample app. But the general concepts here can apply to other languages. Anything that connects to a SQL database uh, can benefit from this. So go ahead and get those set up. I'm not going to go through these installation processes. Since they're pretty standard, I'll leave that to you. I also want to mention very quickly that this video intentionally takes a vanilla approach to connecting to a database container to keep things simple with minimal dependencies, just Docker and .NET or whatever framework you're using. There are actually a lot of ways to accomplish this database container workflow, but we will just implement the essential steps with essential tools. At the end of the video, we'll review some additional concepts around why you'd want to use a database container workflow in the first place, but enough talk, let's jump right into the demo. All right, so I have Docker Desktop up and running. Make sure you do as well, since that'll be required for all the steps ahead in this video. And then let's just keep things simple. So I have a basic terminal window open here. And the first thing we want to do is go out and get the SQL Server image that we're gonna use for our containers. So I'll use this docker pull command, and we're going out to the Microsoft domain and grabbing the latest image of SQL Server 2022. So I'll run that. Now I've already pulled down this image, but it will check to make sure that I'm up to date on the latest. You might get a brief download if you don't already have it on your system, which you probably don't. So just give that a minute to finish. And once that's on your system, uh, you can verify in your images that that was pulled down. So here's our SQL Server image. You can look at that in Docker Desktop. So the next thing we want to do is run the docker run command. So I'll just paste in a command here. This might look a little intimidating at first, but don't worry, we're gonna go through each of these parameters. So we have the standard docker run command, which is what's gonna actually launch our container. And then we're passing in an environment setting here for accept the uh, end user license agreement. And then we also pass in the MS SQL SA passwords, that's system administrator. This sets a variable uh, for a password for the default user on this container. So you do have to include a password and make sure that it meets the strength requirements of SQL. If you just use this one, it'll be fine. Um, or you can look up those requirements yourself. And we're starting that on port 1433, which is a common port for this database server. And then we're gonna name our container local SQL. And this dash D just tells it to run in the background instead of an interactive terminal. And then we also are starting a volume. We'll talk about this a little more later in the video, but this is what's gonna let us persist our database across container instances or life cycles. So make sure you do include this. This will create a volume for us if it doesn't already exist. And then the last parameter is just the image that we want to run. And of course, this is the image that we just pulled down uh, in the step before. So even though this command looks complicated, um, if you just parse the different parameters, they're pretty simple, and then we'll revisit this one uh, sort of complicated one later. So no worries there. So I'm gonna run this, and after you start that, you should get uh, a confirmation here. So if we go back to Docker Desktop, now when we look at our containers, we have our local SQL running, and it's running on 1433, which is good. So we're all set there, and that's actually all we have to do in terms of setting up our container. So now this is available to connect to through an app. So I have this simple .NET app set up and it's using Entity Framework Core to connect to a database. So for example, if we were to open up our cars context uh, class, right now this is just an app that manages some cars placeholder data. So we have a cars DB set that, rec that represents our cars table in the database. But the important thing here is this on configuring method. This is where we can set connection string to what we want to connect to for our database. So we're saying use SQL Server, but at the moment this is using local DB, which comes installed by default with Visual Studio. Uh, 
So it's connecting to a cars database on local DB. And that's all fine and good, but there's a lot of developers out there who aren't going to want to use local DB. They're gonna to wanna to use a container workflow for various reasons that we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. So if we explore how this app is set up, we're just registering our DB context, and then we have a couple endpoints to get and create uh, car entries in our database. So we're using dependency injection to pass in that car's context and then adding cars, returning cars, and so on on these simple endpoints. Now, the one sort of interesting thing here is that during startup, we're using a couple lines of code to make sure that the database gets run. This is essentially programmatically running migrations to set up our database, if you're familiar with Entity Framework. And that's just so that we don't have to run those manually. We're only doing this in development mode. This is probably not something you'd wanna do in production, so just be careful with that. But it makes our setup easier. So right now, if we were to jump out to a browser and test this out, execute our get request, you can see right now there's a test car in the database. But we can also create another one. So if we create another Mercedes car here and hit execute, then if we run our get again, now we have two cars. So this is just storing some basic data in our local DB database. But I'm actually gonna close this out. That'll stop our application for us. And essentially, we just want to take this existing app and connect it to our containerized database instead of the local DB that's installed on our computer that was provided with Visual Studio. So let's head back to our cars context here. And this is where we can set up a connection to our container. And so I have this other connection commented out here. So I'm actually gonna enable this one and disable our local DB. And then let's take a look at what this connection string to our container consists of. So first we define the server, which is just gonna be our 127.0.0.1 uh, IP address for local. And then remember we started that database server on port 1433, so we wanna continue that here. The database is gonna be called cars, and then we have our system administrator login that we configured when we started up our container. And I also added this, um, sometimes you might run into an error about um, a trust issue, so you can add this at the end if you start running into some verification type errors like that. So really simple connection string, just standard SQL Server stuff, but we can use this to connect to our container. Now let's run this app again and see what happens here. And so when this starts, if we were to try this out, um, you can see that zero cars come back and that's because we're working with a new database that runs in our container. But if we go down here and we create a new one, so if we again, uh, so let's say BMW is the make and create that, that came back fine. So now if we run a get from our database, you can see it is indeed there. So that's really all we have to do to actually connect to a containerized database. That's kind of the simplest possible workflow. It's really just as simple as changing the connection string once you have the container running. But there's plenty of other interesting things that we'll wanna take a look at here. So for example, if we head out to our containers. Now remember, containers are supposed to be set up where they can be easily destroyed and recreated without there being dire consequences. So if I were to just delete this container, so our app could obviously no longer connect to that, but normally with Docker, when that happens, if we restart the container, all of that data that we created before would be lost. But in our case, we're actually fine because we created this SQL volume. So if you remember, if we run this command again, that's gonna start a new container. But remember, we had this dash V parameter. And the first part of this is the name of the volume. So it's going to be SQL volume. And then this is telling us to map this directory in our container to that volume. So what that means, if we go back here, under our volumes, again, we have this SQL volume. But now if we go to our container, so this is running again. And if we go inside this container, there's this cool feature if you're on the latest version of Docker Desktop, where you can actually view the file system. And if we compare these, so this is saying slash var slash opt slash ms sql. So if we actually go into our container and look at slash var uh, slash opt slash ms sql, here's where all of our data is stored for our database. So for example, here's our cars.mdf. So we have our database information in here. We have our log information in here. And so essentially this data on our container is gonna be persisted to our volumes. So no matter how many times we destroy or restart that container, as long as this volume persists, 
that data will persist on our container. And that's important because obviously when you're developing against a database locally, a lot of times you want to keep that data set around and keep manipulating it and testing it uh, during different sessions and things like that. So this is a great feature where you can persist data using containers. And we can do that just through this simple volume parameter. So volumes are key when working with databases. Now there's a couple other cool things to consider here too. So if we go back to our app, um, if you remember, I said that we're using Entity Framework, and so we have this code to kind of auto-create the database for us when things start up using migrations. But a lot of times you might not be using Entity Framework, and you want to manage your database more directly. So maybe you just want to run a SQL command to create the database, or you're using like the .NET SQL connection classes, or, or more basic tools to connect to your database. So in that case, uh, we can easily connect to our database directly by running a few additional commands. So one common way to do this is to use docker execute, so this exec command, and then we can make this interactive to our local SQL container and tell it to open um, a bash instance there. So if we were to run this, you can see that now we're inside of our MS SQL container, and that means we can do all kinds of things. So for, for starters, we can start running SQL commands so if I were to paste another command in here, we can go out and we can find the SQL command tool and we can log in with our credentials that we set up before. So if I hit enter, uh, this will give us like command line access to SQL commands basically. So we could just manually create a database or query a database using the SQL command line tools. So for example, I could say create database and we'll call this test DB and I'll hit enter and then I'll type go. So this is a keyword to actually execute that. And now we get a one again because that executed successfully. So let's just check what databases are on this server now. So if I say select name from sys.databases, so let's just get a list of all the databases on the server. And then let's hit go again. And you can see sure enough, there's our list of databases. So we have our cars database that Entity Framework created for us and we have the test DB that we just created manually. So I'm gonna exit out of here and exit again. And so just as a reminder, this is the command to get into the container like that. We just run this execute with the container name and say to open up a bash instance. And from there, uh, we can find our SQL. And to make things even more clear, if we jump back to our container and we look at the file system and we go down to opt MS SQL tools, and then the bin and SQL command. So this is the tool that we're running here. So this lives in the file system of the container. So if you remember, we were running that command that pointed to SQL command and we logged in as our administrator. This is the tool that we were accessing from that path. Now, one of the last things we wanna take care of here is that when you're actually running your container, you probably want to change the password for the system administrator account. I know we set that up with a strong password, but that's stored in that environment right now, and we can actually access that directly by just echoing some things out, and that's not secure. So we actually want to change what that password is, and we can do that using another Docker command. So I'm gonna paste that in here. And so this is the same thing we did before. So we run this uh, execute command interactive to our container, and we point to that SQL command tool again, and then we log in again. So all this we've seen before, all of this up here is just getting us to those SQL command tools in our container. But then we can run a query and we can say alternate login. Um, so we're changing the system administrator login with a new password, which is similar, but I just changed this to 456. So now when we hit enter, that password has been updated. And from then on, we'll have to use that new password to log into SQL. So if we go back to our app, for example, um, and then we go over to our context class, where we're connecting to SQL here, we'd wanna update this to be 456 since we have that new password. And as a side note, you should never hard code connection strings like this, it's just for demonstration purposes. This should live in either a configuration file or some sort of um, secure store for uh, configuration values, but this works for now. So I hope this gives you a good idea of how to connect to a SQL database uh, container. It's really just as simple as starting your container uh, mapping the data on that to a volume, 
And then you can use the different Docker and SQL commands to access that directly if you want to run more commands right against the uh, SQL Server instance running there. Or we can, of course, connect to it through our app, which is just a standard SQL Server connection string, and then everything should work and line up um, like usual. So let's wrap things up here with a quick slide to further explore the high-level reasons you might want to use a container for development. Now, the most obvious selling point of this workflow is that a database container prevents you from having to install and configure full database servers locally. Containers are pre-configured to just work, and they run reliably on any system with Docker or a similar platform installed. If you work with many different database technologies like Postgres, MySQL, and so on, containers can help you greatly avoid a nightmare of installation, versioning, and dependency management issues. Database containers are also useful for devs who like to containerize as much of their entire local workflow as possible, meaning all of their different apps and services. Many modern apps are hosted in the cloud using containers, so containerizing things really helps to create a more comparable environment for dev and testing. Finally, knowing how to work with a containerized database can also be really useful in CI, CD, and deployment workflows. Containerized databases allow you to spin up and access databases in pipeline builds or testing suites where that otherwise might be very difficult, though an in-depth exploration of these scenarios is beyond the scope of this video. So I hope you learned a lot here and feel confident testing this workflow on your own. Thanks so much for watching. Again, please hit subscribe and like to support the channel, and I'll see you next time.